I always felt like even in college, I was always speaking and talking about these issues to my coaches and bringing them up. And I always felt like because I was bringing these things up, I always felt a sense of like I was being ostracized because, you know, I was starting to um, break down the mask, you know, the mask of just being a player, the mask of just being a product, but really breaking down into me just being a human being and wanting to reflect on what does violence mean to me? What does death mean to me? What does humanity mean to me? I'm Robert Perkinson. I'm a professor of American Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm here today talking with Michael Bennett, author of the best-selling book, Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. He is a humanitarian, um, an activist, a philanthropist. He was one of the first NFL players to take a knee during the national anthem to protest police racism. And of course, we are in a convulsive moment in that conversation right now. And today we're going to be talking about a centuries old epidemic of racism in America, as well as the future of the freedom movement. So Michael, good morning. Thanks for joining us. No, I thank you for having me, man. I know all this, the work you've done and things that you've been doing and being able to have these talks, I think is important to progression in America and progression in our own daily lives. We should talk first about the murder of George Floyd and the reaction to it. Um, in one way, murder of black men by police is nothing new. On the other hand, the reaction to it in some ways does seem historic. Um, and I'm wondering what you make of this moment. What is new about it? I don't think there's really much new about uh, African-American males and, and women being um, killed in America. I think historically, there's always been some type of trauma for African-American um, people on the soil of, of America from the beginning of being here. It has been a traumatic experience. And so I think Black people around the country, we kind of are used to this, the violence that's been happening to us. We don't want the violence and we've, we've been fighting to, for equality and fighting for um, the right to exist and to be protected underneath the law of the government. But I think the only thing that is the shaping, this making this have this dysphoria is, is, is social media. I think social media is kind of the, the new catalyst for everybody to know what's happening at once, once, you know, and I think with social media, it allows people to uh, see things. And I think the outrage of a man losing his life and, and asking for his mother and asking for his child to reclaim his humanity is seen on this on social media. And I think it's just brought another side of humanity to uh, people who didn't, uh, who haven't been listening, who haven't been watching, who haven't seen the violence, who doesn't, who don't understand um, what's, what's happening to these families on a daily basis. Yeah, I think what's different maybe is that a different audience is, is paying attention to it. Being a historian of this stuff, I know I can think of um, protests against police mistreatment and murder of African Americans going back to the 1920s at least. Um, but now that it's filmed, more people are believing it. Yeah, I think it was like this thing where it was like a, or wasn't a real reality for everybody. I think the reality for African Americans were living in this the construct of that violence and what was happening quite often in our communities. But I think white America really didn't want to believe the realities and to believe the stories that we were telling because I think the formation of America is like it is very romanticized of what's happening in the trauma. And so when we were speaking, it was almost like it was a fantasy, like this can't be happening. Everything is just, this is equality. Lady Liberty wears a blindfold. She doesn't see skin tone. She doesn't see these things. And I think with media, we're starting to slowly unravel the system that's been holding us back and unravel the things that, the layers of, of this um, oppressive system in so many different ways. There are a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon right now, including, you know, the commissioner of the NFL, um, You've been speaking about that. What do you make of these come latelys to the conversation? It's, it's very hard to stomach a little bit because there's been so much time in between the first protest 
and now, you know, four years since the first time that, you know, Colin Kaepernick took a knee and brought these issues up, right? And between those four years, there's been a lot of lives lost. There's been a lot of time missed. As human beings, you just wonder, like, how much could we have changed? How much could we, could we, how much impact could we have made? What could we have done better? And I think the NFL, what could the NFL have done better? And I just look at this and the commissioner and everything that they talk about, even though now they're getting on to it. And, and I think because now it's socially acceptable to be, have a radical idea, have a radical idea now, you know, before to have a radical idea, you were kind of an outlier. You were kind of like standing alone in, in, in this open farm, you know what I'm saying? But now we, it's, everybody's there because now companies are buying into it. Everybody is seeing the importance of black lives. The thing that we, I worry about is the intent. What is the, truly the intent? Is the intent to show that I'm not a racist or is the intent to change the trajectory of African-Americans' lives in society, to attack the healthcare system, to change um, educational system, to change the judicial system, which has plagued by people of color in this system for so long. It's regardless of intent, I don't know. It, there are ways to react to some of these pronouncements, including from Commissioner Goodell, uh, kind of cynically. Uh, there's a way of being hopeful, even if their intentions are not entirely honorable. And that is, um, if companies sense that the political winds have shifted so much that they have to respond, you know, that means we're in a moment. Like I looked at babynames.com and their whole front page on their website is all names of African-Americans killed by police who they say were once babies. I don't know anything about that company, but the fact that companies and organizations feel the need to express solidarity with whatever intent might mean, might mean we've got a historic opening on our hands. That's no, I think we definitely got I think we got to open and I think the, there is a sense of hope, right? I think there's a lot of people who are connected not just to the color of the African-American people, but black people just, they're connecting to our humanity. I think people are connecting to the, the fact that we we were once babies. I think that's a, a valid point. I think sometimes when, as a black person, you don't really get that opportunity to be a kid because as a young child, you, you're already kind of getting told about the, the story about how you can't do this, what you shouldn't do, how to survive. And I think most times as a kid, you know, you get to live in a fantasy world, but as African-Americans, you don't really have that opportunity. And I think, I think people are coming in, like you said. I mean, I, I mean, intent is important to me because intent shows that it's, it's more than a moment. It's a movement. I think it's a, it's a longer battle than we, we really understand. Like, this is a 400-year war that's been going on for so long. So these moments where people are, are, are awakening and aren't in the illusion anymore, are important, but I think it's important to make sure that our intent is to change the way that society is, is to, and to change policy, to change so many different things and give everybody uh, opportunities. A lot of athletes have also been following your example and speaking out. Some of them who haven't spoken out before, like, uh, you know, Bubba Watson in NASCAR. One of our participants had a question about what advice you have for celebrities or athletes who want to use their voice or their platform, but they're not sure exactly how? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's important to understand the risk of, of speaking out because I think sometimes um, not understanding the risk or what you're doing, it, it, it will, um, when the backlash comes, it'll be overwhelming. But I think if you understand the risk and the importance of uh, using your voice and having yourself be a part of something bigger than just the, your oneself as a collective, I think, standing up and using your voice and if you don't know how i think it's important to uh research i think research is super important because you're going to have to answer questions and you're going to want to be able to rebuttal have a rebuttal when somebody asks you, asks you something and you got to be talk, be able to say some of the numbers and be able to talk about the historical context of what's happening so being able to find somebody who can mentor you if you're a celebrity there's so many people out there there's organizations you don't have to recreate the wheel you are able to go out and being a celebrity, you can ask for help and people show you and guide you into the right way. There's a certain amount of fear with that, but at the same time, there's a certain amount of uh, righteousness too with that, to be able to really shed yourself and your selfish self to be able to think of the whole and think about your children's children and their cousins and their friends. And what does this America look like when you can um, un, un, um, undo your ego? So when you joined with Colin Kaepernick and protesting the national anthem in the NFL, in the NFL, the backlash 
well, expressions of support were prominent and pronounced and national. The backlash was also fierce, fanned by the president, for example. Um, one of our participants, you know, wants to know what that experience was like. What did you What did you learn from speaking out for the first time on that national stage? I think I, I think we, I've been had been talking about stuff for a long period of time. I think slowly America pays attention to what it what it wants to pay attention to, and I think slowly America started to listen to the players. I think players have been saying stuff slowly about Black Lives Matter because I think Black Lives Matter was kind of is was along our uh, evolution too as we were coming to as athletes were coming to their consciousness about the importance of using their voice. I think I learned that there's a lot of backlash that comes with you know having a voice. I think I learned also learned that being in these certain leagues, these leagues weren't ready for to have that talk about the importance of humanity. I think um, profit shares are shared so much about the celebrity and the, and the way that the athlete performs. And it's not so much about his voice or his opinion about society. It's more about um, how much can he sell and what can he do for this organization. So I learned that there's a very, there's a lot of limitations to the, the ability to be able to speak on true issues because everybody was really scared to touch those things because society wasn't really ready for athletes to continue on the tradition of saying what is true, saying what is right, and standing up on their beliefs. I've learned that a lot of people aren't expecting athletes to have that voice. And I think a lot of people, I learned that a lot of people want you to be quiet. I learned that a lot of people don't want you to be um, a voice to, for the people to because when you use your platform at this level, we're talking about in the society with social media, is so it's so big like you know people have 125 million followers bigger than certain countries and around the world so to be able to have athletes have a collective voice i felt like that was something that a lot of leagues and teams that want to have that was a, a part of your book that i thought was poignant you know looking at the ways that even even professional athletes struggle to assert their full humanity because they're often expected to be just players, to be quiet, to follow orders, to, to entertain. What were your first experiences, either at Texas A&M or when you first kind of wanted to start speaking out? What was the reaction you got even before taking a knee? Um, I think my first reaction was just like, it's a human being. What, the, what is it that I, uh, what is it that I see when I see a person losing their life and how am I connected to that? Um, even though, I'm distant and this might not be my relative, this might not be my brother or my sister, but the fact that a human life is no longer on this earth is something that I thought that was, was connected to me, the importance of other people and what they're dealing with on a daily basis, even though um, I'm not directly connected to them, but I am directly connected to them in a certain, in a certain way. And I think that connection was just the humanity side of it. And I think my experiences when while visiting families who are, uh, suffer from police brutality, or suffer from injustices around the world, was just there's, there's a certain empathy that creates a certain um, anger towards you, right? There's anger that you can't protect someone, or the system isn't protecting them, and the anger is not in the sense of you want to like beat somebody up, but in the system of you want to make change, right? You want to go out and make something that happens. And for me, that's how I was connected to was this anger around what can we do, and what how can we use our voices to really amplify the injustice on the darkness to what's happening on so many people around this country. Was it the was it the Charlena Lyles case in Seattle that first kind of got you extensively involved or was it others? Oh so many I mean I think from the beginning, like in the book my book I talked about James Bird and how that affected me as a young child. Oh, and you I were think, that's when you were a kid. Yeah, so it's like a lot of different things. There's so many things like as a kid, like growing up and seeing those things so I don't think it was just one activity. I think it's. I think it was just like a, a, a collection of just things that just constantly start to pile up, and until it was too heavy, and the burden became so heavy that it's like you have to be able to bring people together. But I always felt like even in college, I was always speaking and talking about these issues to my coaches and bringing them up. And I always felt like because I was bringing these things up, I always felt a sense of like I was being ostracized because you know I was starting to. Um, break down the mask, you know, the mask of just being a player, the mask of just being a product, but really breaking down into me just being a human being and wanting to reflect on what does violence mean to me? What does death mean to me? 
what does humanity mean to me? And I think that was my most important thing. You talk in the book a lot about fear in pretty interesting ways. You know, fear that you felt as a protester, fear that you've sometimes felt from police yourself. I think spirituality is something that's super important. I think a connection is overwhelming to walk into some of these these rooms and really feel the anger and really feel the pain of our family. So do these things. So I think our, your spirit has to be right. And I think for me, um, I'm, I believe in God. So, you know, I study the Bible a lot and, and being able to connect um, the past to the Bible and understanding what Jesus Christ did, but understanding the importance of having your spirituality and having the moments to meditate and having that self-care because if you don't, this could be so overwhelming because at the same time, this has been going on so long and there's so much pain. It's so much bigger than one individual. It's just like so much life and so much death has happened before I even existed. You just feel overwhelmed. So I feel like spirituality is super important to be able to have those moments to meditate and to be able to have that self-reflection so you could be able to come out and be able to you know, continue along this warrior's path and continue along this journey of, uh, of of righteousness. What do you think is the best way to make political use of anger, sadness, and hope? I think it, I think all those things are, are connected. I think all those emotions are kind of connected. I think when you feel anger, you feel a sense of, you have this, you, you fighting for the, the survival of hope and sadness kind of runs into anger. And I think um, all those things are needed. I think it's about us exercising ourselves uh, to stand up and get up. I think a lot of times we uh, become like so attached to social media and attached to um, doing these things and, and we're just kind of putting our foot barely in. And I think it, for us to make the change that we want to need, I think it requires us to fully dive in. Once the people in the whole country and the people don't see that it's a divided system, like when they just see um, men screaming and then they're like, well, it's just a man's problem. But when women are screaming too, and black people are screaming, and Hispanic people are screaming, white people are screaming, they understand that this is a problem about humanity. So I think it's important through that hope and that connection that you that you are able to build bridges with other people who have the same ideology with you or, and those who don't, that you can bring along. I'm pretty inspired, I must say, by the breadth and diversity of this movement as it's emerging. Um, you know, police brutality and racism isn't problem that dates back to the very foundation of policing as as was entwined with slave catching and conquest of the of native people a lot of organizations are speaking out suddenly even republicans and some of them are feeling compelled to at least make lip service to police reform so there's some unity that trump is maybe inadvertently forging among people in indignation at his white supremacy. And as you were saying when we were chatting the other day, that means if this is an opening, it means the movement might have a chance to get some real changes. What do you think the, what do you think the movement might achieve now and should demand? I actually that question, what do you think? I think we, I, these moments don't come along very often. I think it's a moment we can ask for big things. Um, you know, a mix of local winnable campaigns for police commissions and funding of more progressive social agencies. But, you know, it's a time we can talk much bigger about decarceration, about moving resources from the very wealthiest to the rest of us, about taking poverty seriously for the first time since the 1960s. I think, I think we've got to dream bigger than really progressives have in two generations. Yeah, I kind of agree with you on the sim simple fact that I think there's like a bigger ask, you know what I'm saying? It's like there's the, the education system. If you look at the um, disproportionate, um, the disparities in the education system, depending on where you live and what, what country, what city, I mean, what county you live in, what city you live in, and what, what part of the town you live in, there's such a big disconnect. And I think the opportunities to rebuild our schooling systems. I think the opportunity, I think COVID-19 shed so much light on the medical system that we have been fighting about. And the medical is not e e equal in America. We see that the racial disparities among the people who are attacked and, and, and within the COVID um, disease and not being able to have the proper um, equipment for these communities of color. I think to re redesign this medical, this healthcare system to where human beings matter, where human beings' existence matter. And it's not built off a capitalistic mindset 
where if the person doesn't have money, they can't survive. I think that is 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 a tragedy within its own self. And I think because we've been in such a this capitalistic mindset for so long, we've almost become um, we've become addicted to the bottle of capitalism, and we've we slowly start to tear our own humanity away where we see somebody else living on the street. We assume that they made a bad decision and they deserve to be homeless. And I think mm-hmm. we have to really dig deep into those questions about, like you said, uh, decriminalizing marijuana in most of these cities around America. We have to start thinking about um, the mass incarceration rate uh, in, in our school, in our schools and in our system for people of color. We have to start thinking about the racial disparities within the job place. And when, it talk, when we talk about opportunity and we talk about being able to live, really live this American dream, this so-called American dream, that really hasn't been for most people, just been for a certain sect of people. And I think um, we put so much emphasis on wealth, we put so much emphasis on materialistic uh, values that we forgot that the most valuable thing on earth is human existence. It's, it's hard, I think, like you were saying, it's sometimes hard for us to dream big if we've been living in a period of selfishness and defeat for almost all of my life and yours. Um, conservatives have been winning. You know, they've been winning on tax policy, making it more unequal and more beneficial to those at the very top of the income scale. They've been winning on anti-poverty programs, cutting them. I think this is a time that we need to start thinking about winning and demanding bigger things. We can't let capitalism control the narrative for uh, the people who aren't able to reach the capitalistic uh, pinnacle in American society. I think when we look at the values of our system, everything in America right now is valued off of the money, right? And I think we saw it in COVID-19 when we had our president say that 100,000 people dying is not a big issue. And to me, that's a big problem because now we're saying open up this country is more important than Saving our, saving our fellow American citizens. And we're all fighting over something and we're not realizing that we all need each other to really exist in this country to make it the way that we see fit. But that requires certain, of, certain people and certain people around the country who have privilege to understand that they have privilege and where that privilege comes from. There's two slogans that have come to the fore in this movement, um, you know, around which protesters mobilize and around which demands can be forged. Um, one is Black Lives Matter, the other is defund the police. And a couple of our participants have been asking, you know, what, what those slogans mean to you or what hopes you have for them? I think defund the police. I think that's just, a, I think it's, I think people get scared because it sounds like when you say defund the police, it almost sounds, I heard Bill, uh, Bill Mayer say like, defund the police, they should change the name to, to where it doesn't sound so like, so radical that people get scared. But it's like, at the same time, the idea that people think that defunding police actually um, disbands the police to where there is no protection and crime is going to be high. I think we're more looking into something where it's more restorative justice and finding ways to police our communities in a way that doesn't end up in death, but where people feel safe enough to be back in the day in those movies and cartoons where white people used to stop and ask the cop, oh, I'm lost and I need need you to give me directions where you feel as a citizen, you can talk to your person who's serving your community, who's a public servant, that their obligation is to make sure that you survive and to make sure that your neighborhood is safe in a way that requires uh, them to think about uh, justice from different perspectives and think about if mental health, like what if somebody has a mental health issue and a police officer isn't able to connect with this person because they may have some type of disease and they assume that this person is violent without knowing their history and this person ends up dead. What if he would, if there was a medical person who knew it could come out and talk to him and de-escalate the situation leading to less violence is important. Yeah, we've been, you know, as a country really good at investing in hard power solutions and the hard power agencies of government. Um, the military of the U.S. is certainly prepared to deal with any conventional national security emergency. Um, we have the world's largest prison system by far and quite robustly funded police forces all across the country. What the pandemic shows is that we've been under investing in all of those soft power agencies that help us deal with homelessness, lower level domestic violence, poverty, evictions, housing, 
and our ability to respond to public health crises. Uh, so the way I, yeah, the way I think of defund the police means um, let's invest resources in the agencies that bring us together and that foster more equality and that provide kind of services that people kind of need. Yeah, I agree with you too, because like you said, I think during this COVID-19, we really saw the disparities in those systems that weren't properly funded. And it was like at this one moment where the light, we were hoping the light never shined on those those public offices or those public servant um, uh, organizations. And when the light shined on them, we really looked that they couldn't really handle the weight of truly of America was in a disaster of America was in the moment of a crisis. We didn't have the proper um, tools to really navigate through this, right? And I think um, we, like you said, defunding and reinvesting is important to, to, I think what we're really looking at is restabilizing the foundation of America's morality and the foundation of the connection of the public servant to its community. And I think that's important because if that's devalued, we're going to be left with a system of, of, of violence and more oppression because there's not going to be any balance. And I think we've been looking at a system that hasn't had any balance over this last hundred years. And now it's time to rebalance that, to refocus on our energies, to um, really the, the sanctity of, of human life. I mean, the fact that, you know, we were looking at 26 million people unemployed in America and not having been and not being able to live in fair housing. And we're looking at, you know, winters where we're having homeless people living on the streets and dying from being in the cold winters because they don't have a home. I think it's important that if, as we as human beings start to really, really connect and rechange and re mind frame and re get off the pill and, and get to like in the matrix again and come out the matrix and start to disillusion ourselves, right? We've been in this illusion for so long that this is the only thing that we know at this moment. What and and your the way that Black Lives Matter as a slogan resonates with you or how you explain it to others? First, I want to ask you a question before I answer that question. Okay. What is utopia or what does a system look like to you that is fair in America that is uh, just for society? Like, because I've been looking at all types of books and I can't find a moment in the, in the history of man besides Adam and Eve that there was ever stability in, in, in that. So, I don't... Well, I, you know, I don't know if I can pull out uh, an example of a society that I would think was the most idyllic, but I think we can, what we can do is think about the society we want and take steps toward it. Um, we don't necessarily know how far we will get, but we can make progress. Um, and we've already, you know, we've already made progress in fits and starts over the generations. And I think if we, if people come together now and demand that wealth of this hugely productive economy be shared, um, mm -hmm. that the rhetoric of economic mobility becomes a reality, that we really invest in education and our people. If we look at funding schools before prisons, if we look at taking you know, climate change seriously, uh, we can start moving s in small ways and big ways toward a society that allows more freedom and more full humanity for more people than we have now. Is that enough or not quite satisfying? I mean, I just, it's your answer. I feel like maybe trolls. Trolls is the best way of describing it. Maybe what? Uh, Trolls, maybe the cartoon trolls. <laughs> yeah, it's true. There was also a lot of singing. <laughs> yeah, we need more singing. We need more pain. But like, but for me, Black Lives Matter is simply is simple for me is that African American people in, in society matter. Like, right? We look at this. We look at the society in every single facet of African American existence is is a sense of exploitation of it. Whether it's with music, whether it's with athletes, whether it's with. Uh, Art, wherever it is, and 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 people on and, and police brutality, or in the system of poverty and redlining and gentrification, there's a lot of this going on. And I think Black Lives Matter reminder is that we are human beings, people. We are we are beings that live. No matter Plessy versus Ferguson, we had to fight to be a full man in the eyes 
of, of, of white America in the eyes of this, um, of this government. But at the same time, our existence is blessed by God. Our existence and, and our humanity is blessed by the blood of God, right? So at the end of the day, to me, it's just it's Black Lives Matter mean that we matter in every single thing. Our children matter, our women matter, our husbands matter, our fathers matter, our, our wives matter. Every single thing is that it's about us being able to say that it's okay for us to exist. It's okay for us to have safety. It's okay for us to reclaim our humanity. And I think that's a whole step to, um, to why Black Lives Matter was such a big movement because it's a reminder that, hey, for, for if you live in a world, you live in a system where you're constantly reminding and it's the system's, it's system's obligation and it is to remind you that you are very small into, into what is important into the fabric of society. But here comes Black Lives Matter is screaming loud. It's like the Black Pride movement and, or and Black Power movement back in the 60s with Stokely Carmichael. You know, just this fist reminded us that our identity, we don't have to change our hair. We don't have to do this. We could just be us and that's enough. And as Angela Davis says, you know, if we, if we act as if Black Lives Matter, if we act as if those who have been mistreated over the arc of history matter, um, then we become a society that can really allow all lives to matter. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where when white people see it, it's just this unconscious, unintentional racism that I think a lot of times white people don't even realize that they're being privileged to even have the, 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 the worst to even say things like, um, I don't see color. Like to say that you don't see color is almost not, that's even worse than calling somebody the N word is that you're not even acknowledging that they have, like you basically, when you say that the N word, at least you're acknowledging like, hey, you black, but I don't even respect you. But at least if they, when you say you don't see color, it's like they don't not even respecting your being, respecting your skin color as though your skin color really doesn't matter because they don't see that. They have to, you have to be able to see the exterior of somebody to understand the interior of them. And I think uh, we, we missed that a lot. A, n a number of the participants on the line have been asking about, um, you know, your experience living in Hawaii and how you think race and racism off operate differently in Hawaii than on the continent. I don't think race and racism operates different in Hawaii. I think everybody that lives in a certain place like to, to think that the place that they live in doesn't have racism. They like to think that their place that they live in is perfect. If we look at the... The, if we look at Hawaii and we look at the history of Hawaii, we can understand that um, that the colonial mindset of how Hawaii even existed to this moment, um, the the fight for the indigenous people to have their sovereignty is important. As we look at Black Lives Matter as an individual, and I challenge every Hawaiian or people who are in Hawaii to look at that too, because the, the Black Lives Matter movement is intersectional with the indigenous people of Hawaii's movement and the importance of them having a voice and the importance of that. So I think there is a is a certain uh, segregation and, and a certain racism in Hawaii that people don't really want to talk about. And I think um, as you go through it, people see you differently. I think there's, there's a sense of love and there is a sense of Ohana, but still the structural part of it is still exists. If we look at the different schools, if you look at the, the schooling system in Hawaii, we look at the private schools such as Punahou and all these great schools. Iolani, we look at these schools and these schools have massive opportunities, massive books, massive everything. And we look at some of the public schools in Hawaii, they don't even have, have air conditioners, not even able to have books. We have people, my friends that work in, um, around in these communities and have to bus kids so kids don't have food. You know, we have these things in Hawaii that people think that it's not lit was happening, but we, their schools, and why now where 80% of the kids are homeless? How is that not part of segregation in a system that is oppressing a lot of different people who don't have a voice? And if you look at the people who come from all these islands, their islands were being bombed and used and, and now they're here living in Hawaii and they're still having to live in a segregated neighborhood and segregated system and not being able to have the opportunities or, or, or the, or, or just to, to be able to exist in a way that's safe for them. Um, Valima Watson, she does so much work in, 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 in the community in Hawaii, and I have so much opportunity to see the work that she's done with all the KQ around Hawaii, and you see those stories, because I think a lot of times people, when they see Hawaii, we assume that it's beach. 
um, sun and all these things. And, and those things do happen. Hawaii is beautiful and has all these different things. But there's a sense that when people visit Hawaii, they should see the structure and what's happening to people all around Hawaii. Yeah, and this COVID pandemic has really revealed just how precarious so many people's lives are in Hawaii economically, how many people were living paycheck to paycheck or doing a little less well than that, just barely clinging to their homes, barely making ends meet. Um, and now so many of those families are thrown into crisis, um, even more and, than and, were in crisis before. And if we look at the historical part of it too, the historical factor, um, the oppression that the Hawaiian people had, not being able to speak their language, being able to not be in place because of their dark skin, because those things are still, that's the history of things that have happened. And I think a lot of times people overlook that because they don't want to look in the mirror and really understand the amount of pain that was caused by the racism and the system that was uh, perpetuated and still being perpetuated at this moment as we look forward in, in the history of Hawaii. And we look at the history of America, I think there's been a lot of oppression. And I think a lot of times what happens with oppression around America is that we, um, we isolate our events. We isolate the Black Lives Matter to being just about Black people. We yeah. isolate the indigenous movement. We isolate the, the Japanese internment camps in America to just being towards Japanese. But those are literally wars on humanity. And the connection between us is important to really bring those issues to light and to highlight those people who have experienced those traumas and not to play down those traumas and saying, oh, their experience is as bad as mine. No, their experience is just like yours because they weren't allowed to be full humans. Um, welcome, Akimi, to the conversation. I just was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this organization that you've been involved, that you're directing, and that you've been involved in founding in Hawaii and how it is kind of taking a unique approach both to this place and to the issues that we've been discussing. For having me. Aloha, Michael. Nice to be on the call with you today. Thank you for the work that you do. I'm really happy to explain a little bit about the Popolo Project. We're a small nonprofit based here in Hawaii that focuses specifically on the experience of being Black in this place. Um, so the work that we do is about providing some of that historical context. It's about providing space for our community to gather. Um, black people in Hawaii are around two and a half percent of the total population. But as Michael was just saying, you know, our issues, our, our culture, our struggles are interconnected with other people who live here, especially indigenous people um, and other Pacific Islanders who are living here in Hawaii. So um, our work is really to, what we say is we our work is to redefine what it means to be black in Hawaii and in the Pacific through cultivating radical reconnection to ourselves, our community, our ancestors, and this land. Um, let's also bring uh, UH Law Professor Ken Lawson into the conversation and we'll, we'll be talking the four of us. Um, so Ken at the moment is the co-director of the Hawaii Innocence Project. Um, he's also been outspoken in revealing and talking about uh, corruption and misconduct within the Honolulu Police Department. But Ken, I just thought first, because we're in this historic moment and you've lived through similar ones, if you might speak for a moment about your own experience representing clients involved in police violence and homicide cases before you came to Hawaii and how you think that helps you see this moment. Well, you know, I wanted to become an attorney in large part because when I was a young black man coming up in high school, uh, being stopped by the police and being harassed by the police. And I think, you know, a, what resonated with me about the George Floyd killing was when I saw that, that look in that officer's face as he held his knee on our brother's neck, right? Looking back into that camera, that's, a, that's the look that a lot of black men and women have seen in police officers' eyes for years. And so uh, after law school, when I started practicing uh, criminal and civil rights law in Cincinnati, Ohio, I represented family. In fact, a young man that, that went to high school before I had 10 years in front of me in high school was a star basketball player in Cincinnati, was killed the exact same way that George Floyd was. And this was before police departments understood positional asphyxiation. And so I remember going to the uh, uh, coroner's lab and looking at that brother's body and seeing the knee prints on the back, on his back where the police had, had held him down. I remember going to the uh, uh, coroner's lab and seeing bullet holes in the back of men's, black men's head uh, and being with these families and then also being subjected to that type of uh, racial profiling myself. And so in Cincinnati in 2001, I represented the families, the 15th unarmed black man and woman that had been killed in a two year period in Cincinnati. It erupted in the riots. And, and so, you know, going through what we see now, 
on the mainland. What's been different is, and I think Brother Bennett uh, talked about it, is, is the, and you talked about it, right? It's just all races are seeing it now, right? All races are seeing it now. Because before then, when, when Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman, right? And that's when the Black Lives Matters movement started, right? And, and what it's saying is when you kill us, you being a police or you being somebody in the position of the police, somehow you're not charged. If you are charged, you're being acquitted. Our lives don't matter. And that's where that scream came from, you know? And, and, and what happens real quick is when you start doing this type of stuff, you, you, you know, society will, you know, a lot of people in public will try to put you into a corner where it's like, well, you're anti-police, right? Or you're racist or all lives matter and all that stuff. And that's not what anybody's saying. Uh, uh, you know, so when, when Michael and, and, and the other NFL players are protesting by taking that knee, they try to, you know, they try to box in where you must be anti-flag, anti-American. And that's not what anybody's been saying. And I think with this George Floyd video, right, everybody's now saying, okay, now I understand what you all mean by Black Lives Matter. And going back to Michael's earlier point, what is your intent? You see, these are the easy cases. These are the cases where everybody, yeah, hey, hey, that's murder, right? But look at the brother that was killed in Atlanta over the weekend, right? Oh, well, you know, that, that, well, I was with y'all with that George Floyd guy, right? You know, I understood his death, but you know, that guy in Atlanta, hey, you know, I can understand why the police killed him. And that's when you'll see those that's out there now start backing up. And again, there was no reason for that brother to be killed. And that's what we've been saying. Because, see, I represented a, a big white client, way bigger than Michael Bennett, right? They get drunk, man, at, on, you know, at, 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 and, and go into Waffle Houses and start brawls with police and beat them up, and they living. And they living. And all we're saying is, you know, there's, there's got to be a better way uh, for the police to interact with, with uh, the black community where we're not losing our lives. And if we do lose our life, we want you prosecuted, and sent to the same way and with the same fervor you do us when we commit a crime. Um, Ken, just a question for you about your work with um, police and wrongful convictions and criminal justice and race in Hawaii. What's your sense of how Hawaii is different or the same from the continent in terms of the historic and ongoing injustices that we see? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's corruption in our police department, no doubt about it. And, and, and what we don't see is the systematic targeting, but we still see the lack of police training. So we still have a lot of uh, people that are killed in police custody or trying to be uh, taken into police custody that doesn't need to take place here. The difference is, you know, we see that it's being targeted with black men and women and, and kids on the mainland. Here they just doing it. Uh, and, and I think, it's a, you know, we don't have enough data to say if it's, you know, with, with respect to Micronesian and other people of color, but we can say that, that um, our police department needs a lot of training in the area of um, um, use of force. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Ms. Glenn, so like it's been involved in Hawaii for so long, like what are some of the ways that young kids can be activated? Like, you know, finding ways to be active in this moment, like, because I feel like sometimes when I work and I go out to these different schools and I'm doing different things, I feel like sometimes the kids don't feel like they're empowered. Like, what what would you advise people who are working with kids? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge the youth leaders who organized the recent here in high school. Um, those were mostly kids from high school who led those. Wow. Um, they brought out you know, thousands of people for one of the biggest showings that Hawaii has ever seen, certainly around Black Lives Mattering. Um, so those were young people who were, were activated because of what they were seeing um, in social media, but also because of the really strong organization of uh, the folks who have been leading the Black Lives Matter movement. And I want to acknowledge that too, because those are women, Black women who started that movement, queer women um, who as, as Ken said, started in the, in the wake of Trayvon Martin's murder and continued to do this work. And so part of what is different about this moment is that those sisters were very consistent and they continued even when other people didn't take up those arms um, or take up the, the, the banner of, of Black Lives Matter. But to your question, Michael, about what, what young people can do, there are a lot of really wonderful um, community organizations who are doing um, 
education for young people to understand more about the issues, especially here in Hawaii. Um, one that springs to my mind right now is called Weaving Our Stories, and it's organized by two educators, uh, a Black Filipino woman, um, Luana Peterson, and Native Hawaiian sister, Pulama Long, and they convene space for young people to learn about their history and understand how they are part of a genealogy of resistance and solidarity. Um, but they also empower youth to learn about how to share their stories and to make sense of the experiences that they're having. So kids are absorbing this, they're seeing it, um, but they also need the, the context and the support of adults to be able to understand what's going on and be able to look at the patterns that are happening here in Hawaii. As Ken was saying, we don't have a lot of data about what's happening in Hawaii. Um, the Honolulu Civil Beat just released a story this morning about the lack of data around police excessive use of force complaints. We think that that's probably not a coincidence that we don't know. Um, so as both of you have said, um, Hawaii is not necessarily different from what we see in North America, but we're often encouraged to, to act as if it is because the people who are bearing the brunt of this inequality are, are people of color. They're, they are black people, they're people of African descent. Um, we're only two and a half percent but end up making um, disproportionate representation and in incarceration in uh, police use of force complaints, all of that. And then all of us have our own daily experiences. There's tremendous anti-blackness in Hawaii. And then um, on top of that, there's the experiences of native people and, and, and other people of color here. I guess I'd like to hear from each of you about what you think we can win. Um, this is a movement moment. They don't come along that often in history. They're kind of sacred. So what do you think we can win at this moment? How sanguine are you that we can win big things right now? Um, I'd like to hear from, I guess, Ken and then Akimi, and then we'll give Michael the final word and um, round it up. Well, with respect to everything going on nationally, uh, at least changes in, 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 in police use of force that, that are mandated, right? And so when, we, when I did the class action lawsuit in Cincinnati, uh, we have federal oversight. And one of the things that we, and, and I would love to see this here in Hawaii, and I've been working on it with some others behind the scene, but a citizen's complaint authority that's independent from, because if, if, if the police, if a citizen here in Hawaii wants to file a complaint against a police officer, they have to file it at, at the police station, right? And it's going to be reviewed by police officers. Uh, and what we need here is an independent uh, citizen's complaint authority, much like the one we set up uh, on the mainland in Cincinnati. And what we were able to do was it was fully funded, it was independent of the police department, independent of the uh, city council. And it, it, it was um, fully funded to where it had investigators and if a citizen filed a complaint against a police officer, it had to be resolved within 90 days. Um, and, and that way um, um, you can get the officer's discipline, you can start tracking these records uh, and, and, and all these uses of force. Uh, and and what, what happened real quick was, we saw over a five-year period that the, that the amount of complaints against police went down because it also allowed the police to curb their behavior. But we're, in, you know, we have to be able to push the defund police, right? Our police are being used for too many different things, right? right? They had to be social workers, juvenile counselors, all these things that every time something happens, we call the police. Because um, we're not funding those other agencies. We're not funding those other agencies, and it just, it's it's taxing our police, right? And, and so again, um, but it has to be all reorganized, you know. And and the qualified immunity has to get we have to get rid of that because if you can't fire a police officer because of the union, if you can't uh, uh, prosecute one because it's hard to prosecute them, and if you can't sue them because of qualified immunity, what deters them from engaging in this conduct? Um, Akemi, to you, is there one thing you hope this movement can win, and thoughts on how we might get there? Well, I want to contextualize this movement. So for me, this movement is the continuation of 500 years of Black people trying to be free. So it's not that this movement is separate from that. And I think contextualizing us in that way makes it really clear that a big thing that we have to invest in is culture change. So I think strategies for this moment, how do we keep moving this conversation forward? And I think a lot of the stuff Ken was just sharing, I think the calls to abolish the police are part of that strategy as well. Um, but, you know, there's also a larger question of what do we change um, in the ways that we understand, as, as Michael was saying throughout this, this conversation, how do we understand humanity? How do we understand the value of human life? How do we understand the place for an agency that is endowed with uh, the, the right and the force of organized violence to, it, to make sure that society maintains a certain shape? Those are cultural issues. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's, there are policy interventions that can be made along the way. 
But the fact that we're still having this conversation about whether or not Black people are human is a conversation that started in, in the 15th century. In, and it's, it's a culture shift that we need to be affecting. So what I'm hopeful for is that this movement um, is, is making itself um, something that cannot be ignored and continues to be something that cannot be ignored. And what I'm, what I'm hopeful for and what I think we can win is staying, staying visible. Yeah, I, I agree with her too. And both, both, both of Mr. Lawson and Mrs. Glenn is that um, it, it is like this, it's such a, uh, a hard multifaceted question with a lot of multifaceted answers because there's so many things that need to be changed. Basically, we need to just tear down the whole shit and start all the way over. It's like we trying to re remodel a house that doesn't have a, that has a leaky foundation that's built on Chinese stucco. It's like, there's so many things within this foundation for this home that are broken. that it's almost like to reform it and think of it in, in a different way. It almost seems like impossible because I feel like as human beings, our imaginations are so limited. And I think, um, and it's limited because of the, what we've seen, the trauma. I think if you see so much trauma, you you don't think that there's something beyond that wall. You don't think that there's something more than what's been, uh, what's been on us. And I think the, the thing that I think is so true is the humanity issue that, is, that Mrs. Green just went on because we're looking at a system and when you look at Black Lives Matter, you look at New Zealand having riots, you look at Germany having riots, you look at Palestinian, you look at all these different things. Argentina, you're looking at people across the world who say are saying that you don't see me as human beings. And I think we're the fact that human beings haven't been able to have that true humanity is something that we have to really fight for. And I think what she's saying for fight for since the 15th century, fighting for the right to exist is a battle that is uh, is is still hard and I just feel like I don't know is the, the hope is there but I feel like it's a long road to go I feel that as though the steps of progression that we have been taking is like like Marco X says like a there's been a nine inch knife in our back but they pull it out three inches there's still six inches of knife that's still mm -hmm. holding us in there and at, at what point when that knife comes out we don't know right and there's two the steps to what we've really been calling progression is really just the, the steps to humanity civil rights are really humanitarian rights, the rights to have human beings. Now, structural system things we're still fighting for, those are things that haven't changed. Even though civil rights have changed and give us abilities to have certain civil rights, the structural um, oppression is still upon us at every moment. And I think reforming the police system is super important and thinking about it from a different perspective is, is something that I see that is, uh, is much needed at this moment. And I think that is just a small band-aid on the wound that needs surgery. And I think there's a whole system that needs to be changed and um, we need great leadership to make that happen. Well, thank you for the leadership that all of you have been providing. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, thank you for the sober assessment of the problems before us, as well as the hope that an effort you bring to try to move us forward as far as we can get. Um, so aloha, be safe and and I hope to talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.